Good afternoon. My name is Mary Landers and I serve as the Director of Alumni Engagement at UNCG. I'm honored to serve as your moderator for today's session. Before we get started, let me take a moment to provide you with tips for this webinar. Due to the size of our audience today, Alice will be presenting in webinar format. And with this format, you are unable to see the other attendees. Alice very much wants this to be an interactive session. So please feel free to type your questions and comments in the chat box or in the box marked Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We will save plenty of time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. So with formalities behind us, I am now pleased to introduce our speaker today. Alice Irby is passionate about life, people, and the pursuit of excellence. Since meeting Alice in 2013, I've been able to see this passion firsthand. It begins in very subtle ways and becomes evident in all that she does. In her new book, South Toward Home, we have the unique opportunity to learn more about Alice and her life experiences. Told from her perspective, Alice recalls her blessed yet turbulent life in and out of the South. Alice's knack for storytelling gives each of us the opportunity to live, relive many of her experiences. We are introduced to the people who empowered Alice to become the woman that she was meant to be strong, independent, and fiercely devoted to her family and friends. So without further delay, I am proud and honored to introduce Alice Joyner Irby as our guest presenter today. And I'm so excited for the conversation. Welcome, Alice. Thank you so much, Mary. And I'm excited about talking with all of you. For those of you who've seen my book, you know that it's a series of discrete stories about my life, my friends, my family, my mentors, some barriers I faced in the workplace, but also some opportunities that came my way. Several of the stories focus specifically on the Women's College or its alumni. But today, instead of talking about discrete stories, I want to take an approach of following threads that weave throughout the book, threads that connect some person, something, some incident in my life to alums or faculty of the Women's College or UNCG. So I've labeled my comments, connecting threads. Let's start at the edge of the river in my hometown. And the cover of the book, as you can see here, wraps around the contents to show the full impact of the river. Here's the full picture next to the cover. Now imagine standing on the bank of the river as pictured here. Notice the rocks. What's your sensation? It's wild, it's turbulent, it's dangerous, it's mesmerizing, it's life-giving, it's magnificent. I went every day except Sunday to the river during my high school years. When I worked at the swimming pool at the community center, which was an old restored mill right on the banks of the river, I saw the view from these rocks every day. So how could a young girl not absorb its wonders? So the river and my house on Elm Street, the Methodist church right around the corner and the school building five blocks south anchored my world. And I shouldn't forget to mention the railroad tracks on the other side of the houses across the street from where I lived. Weldon wasn't just a little farming community on the edge of a river, however. It was that, but it was much more. It was a window to the world. It was a welcoming place for newcomers and strangers. It had a major north-south highway going right through the main street in Weldon. It was a bustling business community. And it was anchored by two national rail lines that crisscrossed downtown. It had a hotel, a few tourist homes, boarding houses, Immigrants coming into the country at the turn of the century settled there. Descendants of settlers thrived there. It was a magnet of opportunity. And sometimes it was described as exotic. As one African-American woman my age told me not long ago, we had it all. And she went on to describe the features and the fun and the festivals of her youth. My growing up for my first eight years in my grandmother's boarding house 
multiplied my fascination with strangers because I saw people from far away. If we have time to chat, I'll tell you more about living in a boarding home. And I think we have a class of 55 along with us, Mary Owens Fitzgerald, who also knows about her grandmother's boarding home. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now I want to tell you a little bit about my mother. Mother was the first in her generation and her family to go to college. I really don't know how she did it because my grandmother was left a penniless widow when mother was about eight years old. William, her older brother, had graduated from high school and he had a job, so I imagine he helped out a little bit. And granny was an astute businesswoman, and so I'm sure she was able to provide the basics for mom and mom worked herself. Dad had been courting her for a while, going as far as Greensboro to see her on occasion. And this is what she looked like during those days at NCCW. She doesn't look very happy here. She seemed to prefer the out of doors or at least her knickers, but she was always glad to see dad. Her teaching in Whitaker's, not far from Weldon, made courting easier and soon dad and mother were married. Here they are about the time of their marriage. His name was William Bridgman Joyner, a man from Muffersboro, a town about 40 miles east of Weldon. And he had come to Weldon as a young man to find a job and make his career. Before I came along five years later, mother and dad lived with my grandmother so that mother could help her with a boarding house. Granny was beginning to have some chronic health problems by that time. But mother was the epitome of what an NCCW woman was supposed to be. And for those of you who know about Harriet Elliott, you know what I'm talking about. Committed to educating young people, vigilant in her service to her community, devoted to her church, constant in her faith, attentive to her husband and children. As a matter of fact, before my grandmother would let my mother marry my dad, she insisted that dad move his membership from the Baptist church to the Methodist church. By the time of the Second World War, my grandmother had died and mother and dad had paid her medical bills and closed the boarding house. And dad had opened his furniture store and mother had resumed teaching. She taught both French and history for many years until she retired at age 62. Years later, near the end of her teaching career, she served on the advisory council of the Alumni Association. And here you'll see mom during her teaching years. Her students adored and respected her. Once I went to a high school reunion and people that I didn't even know walked up to me and told me what an influence she had been in their lives and how she always urged them to aim high and do their best. Not long ago, when a former student, Frank Barham, read my book, we talked on the phone. He told me what an inspiration mother had been to him. I gather from what he said, he was not always a straight A student, but she always reminded him never to give up. And he had saved some of the notes that she had written to him. He is now a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia. So he did okay. She helped many others go to college who never would have done so. But there's another NCCW alum I want you to meet. From the time I was five years old until I graduated from high school, I took piano lessons from Louise Farber. She was my mother's college roommate and best friend. And here you see Louise on the left is her college picture. And on the right, she's standing with her brother Ellis and her niece Marilyn. And that smile and facial expression of Louise is just the way I remember her. She always smiled, was always upbeat. She's mentioned in several of the stories. There's not a story dedicated to her itself, but she's mentioned in several of them. And it's clear as you read those stories that she was a major influence in my life. Not just giving me the gift of music, but in opening windows to a larger world that I was yet to experience. 
My lessons were supposed to be about an hour in length. Often they were two hours or more. And Louise and I would just sit around and talk about whatever was on our mind. One day I asked her about a book I'd read, Gentleman's Agreement. It was about 1947. Some of you may remember that it was made into a movie. It was about anti-Semitism in the United States. I was absolutely shocked by the book because I had no idea of the extent of anti-Semitism in this country. I thought that was something that happened in Germany and Europe as a result of the Nazis and the allies. Louise opened my life to Jewish, opened my eyes to Jewish life in the diaspora and in the migration of Jews from Europe to this country. As most of you know, it wasn't until 1947 or 48 that Israel was created as a state. Louise never got to Israel, but I did. And my visit to Jerusalem in January 2017 brought back memories of Louise because I stood one morning frozen in place as I heard the notes of Mozart's Turkish march coming over the sound system in a public hotel restroom of all places. That was the composition that I had played in my senior recital. So there I was standing in that restroom saying thanks to Louise for her gifts and retracing our conversation years earlier. You'll find that on page 359 in my story, Amazing Grace. Not until my junior year in high school did I lay eyes on the Women's College campus. I was chosen to represent my town at Girl State in the summer of 1949, and I packed my bags for a week's study of government and civics. It was sponsored by the American Legion Auxiliary. There were students there from all over the states. It was a bit overwhelming until Mr. Charlie came to greet us. Some of you will remember Mr. Charlie Phillips, Director of Government and Public Relations. He was the perfect man to oversee that program because he was friendly, helpful, cheerful. He didn't seem like a highfalutin university administrator. And fate would lead me years later to return to the campus to join his staff. Deciding to enter the Women's College as a freshman a year later was no leap. I'd been impressed with the breadth of offerings available for a young person like me who had no idea what she wanted to do. Making my way to WC that September was the real beginning. The beginning of a series of connections and bonds that have last, lasted a lifetime for me. The year was 1950, mid-century. Many of you will remember it. We had just witnessed and endured with our families the largest and most destructive war in history. We had just learned about the USSR building an atomic bomb, setting in stone the Cold War. Life magazine had reported that Mao and the Chinese Communist Party had gained control of China. And we had just witnessed the invasion of South Korea by USSR-sponsored North Korea. And what did that mean? That meant that our friends and our boyfriends were going to war. But at Women's College, there was more than attending class and studying or sleeping in the library. Courtesy, that virtue, you know, courtesy is in short supply these days. But then it was not only valued, but expected of every student. It had to do with manners and consideration of others, something that was sort of lost in the waning decades of the 20th century. But in 1950, it was on the lips of our freshman hall counselors who insisted that their charges behave well. Behave well with their elders, but also with each other. And we were reminded again and again during our required Monday evening gatherings in our freshman parlors. Finally, some of us had heard enough. So about 40 of us decided it was time to bury courtesy, which we did, breaking curfew, in a midnight ceremony in the middle of the freshman quad. Shrouded in sheets and blankets, we marched with candles in a circle around a small grave site dug by our leader, Margaret Crawford, 
class of 54. Committing the virtue of courtesy to eternal damnation, we quickly chanted a dirge, scampered back to our rooms before we could be identified, caught and restricted. To our surprise, our counselors didn't even, even acknowledge our deed except in passing. How disappointing. Nevertheless, courtesy and our counselors prevailed and we were given reminders from time to time. Now on the serious side, I worked hard to succeed in my classes. I became interested in current affairs and history and political science. And I took a course in ethics and the professor who taught it caught my interest and stirred my imagination. And that professor was Warren Ashby, who became not only my professor, but a great friend until his death in 1984. His wife, Helen, was an inspiration to me as well. Warren is featured in numerous stories in my book. In the story about my years at WC, entitled My Love Affair with Learning, and there's an entire story devoted to Warren and Helen. You know also that a residential college is named for him, the Ashby College, and that story is also in the book. The Jackson Library was the center of my undergraduate world and a place of work, study, and contemplation for Warren as well. I could spend the whole hour talking to you about Warren, which I can't do, but I do want to read a passage from the book it's in the story Awakened, and it's about his memorial service. Excuse me just a minute. <clears throat> at his request, I presided at his memorial service held in the alumni house in 1984 in USCG. Before he became ill for the last time, he had requested that three of his former students participate in the service. Sally Buckner, a poet at Peace College, whom some of you may have known, recently deceased, and Mary Hill from Winston-Salem served along with me. Warren requested no eulogy, rather readings of poetry by Sally, readings from his diary by Mary, a George Herbert poem and prayer read by James Allen, piano music by his faculty friend, Robert Darnell, playing Beethoven and a Brahms intermezzo, and brief comments by me, ending with a poem. The day before the gathering at the family home in Greensboro, Helen gave me several of his journals to read, telling me that Warren wanted to share them with me. I spent several hours before the service, sitting in his study in the Jackson Library, looking at pictures of his family, scanning the titles of his books, reading the pages of his journals. I shed a few tears and I said a prayer. As I looked at pictures of him, I could feel his presence there and imagined him quiet with contemplation, anticipating a changed world or engaged in a conversation with a student. What a force he was for change and for good on the campus, establishing a residential college that thrives to this day. What a leavening yet expansive influence Warren had on the lives of many residents in Greensboro, as he worked with McNeil Smith, a very well-known lawyer there, and others to ensure a smooth transition to integration of schools in Greensboro. I count myself among the multitudes who benefited time and again from his wisdom. As I sat in his office reading words he had penned by hand, my head spun with a jumble of sensations, of loss and grief, yet equanimity, optimism, and hope too. His spirit, infused by the harmonies of Dvorak and Beethoven, would continue to enliven the campus and city life and be a source of strength for his family. Such too were his last words in his journal. And I want to read those to you now. Quote, it might be nice to have some refreshments catered so that persons present would be encouraged to greet friends and talk as they do in any meaningful and happy time. Do what is right for you. If nothing, fine. If something entirely different, fine. Above all, make it a satisfying happiness. I have been and am, unquote. 
One of Warren's best friends described him as, Warren is just deep good. Warren was deep good. In the 1950s and 60s, we went through turbulent times. Many of you remember those. I was caught up in the vortex of change, both at WC and later in my career. There's a sentence in the prologue of the book that speaks to my life during those years. And I quote, time after time, year after year, I found myself at the intersection of discrimination and liberation, of segregation and integration, of the pull of tradition, but also the desire for change. Little did I know that later in that decade, I would be recruiting and admitting African-American students to WC when I became director of admissions. Ms. Mossman, Mary Mossman, whom you see here, as vice chancellor appointed me to that position and she became much more than my boss, my mentor and my model of a successful administrator and educator. I never dreamed I would have such a job. I wanted to be an administrator like her in the field of education. And that became my life's work in one place or another. The 1960s, as some of you know, started with the sit-ins in Greensboro. The story in the book about my life at WC describes my involvement with some WC students who supported and, enjo and joined the protesting students. They didn't sit at the Woolworth counter, but they did uh, help the students in their preparation and were involved in their activities apart from the Woolworth counter. And again, Dr. Ashby, Mary Mossman and I came together to assist in the resolution of a situation in which the students found themselves, they had violated some of the campus rules. Those formative years at Women's College prepared me to seize new opportunities and venture into the world of standardized testing at Educational Testing Service. But on leave from ETS, I assumed a role in the Johnson administration with the war on poverty. Washington in the mid 60s, as you know, was caught up in the forces of the civil rights movement with the March on Washington by Martin Luther King and the avalanche of legislation that President Johnson was, was pushing through Congress. People were full of hope. I remember well the maneuvering in the administration and of Congress passing the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. That was the foundational bill, a piece of legislation forbidding discrimination in employment and in public places, discrimination based on race ethnic origin or gender. But there's a little footnote to history there that I might tell you later. Gender was not included in the early drafts of the legislation and it got in, put in in a strange way in the House bill. That was an exciting and instructive time in my life. But still, I and many others in the workplace, many other women, faced barriers when we were, tried to exercise our rights. As you may have read in my story about just a bowl of peanuts, I faced discrimination in my first job out of graduate school when I went to work at Merrill Lynch. And again, when I tried to fly on a United Airlines executive flight, that turned out to be a flight for men only, though I counted myself an executive at the time. That's in my story, The Not So Friendly Skies. About the same time, another young woman from Weldon and also a woman's college grad, Jean Satterthwaite, was changing policies at the New York Times. The Times featured separate warn ads for men's and women's employment. That meant that there were some jobs for men and there were other jobs for women. Jean headed a letter writing campaign that changed all that. And she herself ended up being president of NOW in New York City. There are many college friends that I could mention, but I want to single out one, Mary Beacom Bowers. You'll see her picture here with me. Some of you may remember her as Mary Lib Oswald. She's profiled in my story, Mary Mary. Fresh out of college, Mary took a job with the Red Cross in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where she met John Beacom, her future husband. On to Kent State, where each of them taught English and reared her daughter, Susanna. Some years later, after being widowed twice, Mary, along with two friends, published a new magazine, The Bird Watches Digest. It was a monthly magazine based on the Reader's Digest. 
Mary became friends with Roger Torrey Peterson, and he wrote the introduction to a book that she published. Indeed, Mary, Mary Lib as we called her, lived the WC motto of service. But her knowledge of birding has a direct bearing on the life of my grandson, James. From the age of 10, when James spent an afternoon with an NC State professor, he had been committed to doing research on birds. That was the career he wanted. Mary encouraged his ambition. And when time came to apply to colleges, Mary knew the one or two universities that offered the kind of curriculum that James wanted to have. Under her guidance, he chose LSU, Louisiana State University, and ended up getting not only a degree, but a wife. The years passed, I reared my daughter Andrea, continued my career with ETS in Princeton, and also with Rutgers University in New Brunswick. And in those pos positions, I kept trying to expand opportunity for students and sought to be of service. There's stories about ETS and about Rutgers in the book. In 1999, I headed south toward home, which was always my intention. I settled in Pinehurst to be near my sister, Margaret, not too far from my daughter and grandson in, in Raleigh. And my brother had retired to Moorhead City about the same time. It was the first time in 40 years that the three siblings had been close enough to get together often. And we took several trips together, just the three of us, usually searching for ancestors. We visited graveyards, cemeteries, churches, old, old homes and towns, and we actually found newly discovered relatives, all to fill gaps in our knowledge about our family. And here you see I'm on the left, George is sort of in the middle, Margaret is on his left, and Gwen is his wife, she's on the far right. But I have something else to tell you. Both George and Margaret are Women's College alums. George went to graduate school there, got a degree in math, Margaret to undergraduate college. So that means that my entire immediate family, except my dad, are alums of MCCW or WC. And there's also another alum in the book, Harriet McCallum Hines, who is in school with my sister. And I hope she's with us today. And there's another story about how I met her through a childhood friend, and we ended up getting together often most recently in 2029 in Weldon. In the early 2000s, UNCG, I felt was as welcoming to me as a woman's college had been in the 1950s. It was five times larger, new programs in schools, intercollegiate athletics, recognized now as a research university. The university prospered under the leadership of a visionary chancellor, Patricia Sullivan, shown here with her well-known smile. Her masterpiece called for steady but careful growth, building on each, successful, each successive addition. Anchoring it all was still the dedication to liberal learning that had so marked the Women's College as a place of distinction in the lives of many young women. Serving together on the planning committee for our 50th class reunion, Barbara Paramore and I became reacquainted. We're shown here on a trip to the national parks in Utah. We decided to take a trip together in Spain, to Spain. And that trip led to many more and our relationship has, has deepened into a very deep friendship. Thank you, Barbara. And she's featured in my last story, South Toward Home. And I hope she's with us today. I know she planned to be. I also added another picture from our 53 union because I wanted to show you the happy faces of Nancy Jean Snow and Margie Pressinger Haynes. That was at our luncheon that day. Well, not many years later, the university was seeking support to fund the renovation of the quad. Otherwise, the dorms we knew as freshmen would be torn down. Well, alums from far and near couldn't let that happen. And among others who heard the call, were Andrea and James using part of their inheritance. They underwrote the naming of the parlor in cotton, because it had to be cotton, in memory of my father and mother. 
So even though Andrew and James are not UNCG alums, they are connected in perpetuity to the university. Here the three of us are in New Orleans to support LSU in a big football contest. James took a little time off from studying birds. He was a student at LSU at the time. It was party time in New Orleans, but we lost to Alabama. But here's James, a graduate student in ornithology at the temple in Machu Picchu in 2018. Mary Lib was really proud of him and I was too. Here's an inscription that I chose to go on the wall at the outside entrance to Cotton. I think you might be able to read it. The residence halls of the quad are gathering places for conversation, social interaction, discovery and debate. This continuing focus on undergraduate liberal arts education through communities of learning is the core of UNCG's future as well as its legacy. And here are the students in the kitchen of Cotton are joining the joint of parlor, doing exactly what I hoped, engaging in conversation, and this time around food. Now I want to end with a recent connection. Minerva exemplifies the love of learning and the appreciation of the arts that characterized the Women's College. We're all indebted to the class of 55, I think it was the class of 55, for making possible this lovely statue. My story is about Christopher Hodgkins, a professor of English there. I've known Chris for about 10 years, first on campus, then through the English Speaking Union, then in association with the conferences of the Atlantic World Research Institute, which he chairs. When reading books to try to understand the biblical David, I wrote to Chris, this was several years ago. I wrote to Chris because I thought he, knew, he, he taught a course on the literary interpretation of the Bible. Well, it turned out at that time, he was writing a book and he shared with me his chapter on the books of Samuel and Kings. Somehow in conversation with him not long ago, I learned that he was offering that class this semester, both in class to students and online. And he graciously allowed me to join by way of his online link. So people, here I am 70 years later, getting up early as I did in the 1950s to take an eight o'clock class with my favorite professor, most recently this morning. I hope he'll speak up during the chat to talk about what it's like there now. So things have come full circle for me. Since that hot August day in 1932, springing from my mother's womb, Specific individuals, an alum, a professor, a classmate, a family member, have formed with me what I call an unbroken band, a band of kinship, continuity, inspiration, comfort throughout my life. It's been another different kind of Southern home, but no less embracing. So thanks for listening. And now I turn things over to Mary for our chat. Thank you, Alice, that was wonderful. And I know that we have people that are anxious to ask you questions and make some comments. And Christopher is one of them. So um, we're gonna get Christopher unmuted here and let him step in here. I've unmuted myself, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yes. Good. Well, this is uh, Chris Hodgkins in the English department. I am class of 1952 professor uh, named for a uh, women's college class and it's, of course it's been a joy and an honor to get to know alice uh, first as a distinguished alum of, of women's college uncg and then as a very very good friend and a co-worker and an ally in many good causes and of course it's been a delight to have her participating in my class um, it's a little nervous making having such an experienced and uh, highly in, uh, informed person listening in on uh, the class discussion in my lectures. But uh, as to the, the importance of the liberal arts, uh, I would like to make reference to Alice's own story of having buried courtesy in the quadrangle of her college dorms. 
um, I lay down three ground rules, especially in my Bible class, uh, which involves, of course, the discussion of uh, many, many books of the Bible, which are deeply beloved, but also highly controversial, and especially a state university. So I, I lay down three rules. First of all, uh, the rule of openness. I, I tell them that uh, this is a state university and the state is incompetent to judge in religious matters. I'm not here either to oppose or to endorse any particular religious viewpoint, but to listen to everyone speak and to respond. Uh, I also expect people to exercise, and this is the second point, basic respect for each other. You can disagree, but disagree uh, with uh, consideration for other people's dignity. Uh, and third, I expect relevance, I say. That is, uh, of course, studying a great collection of books like the Bible invites us to expatiate on our own personal philosophies of life, which is just fine. Uh, but to make our comments relevant to the text at hand, to speak to the subject matter. There's a kind of discipline involved in any classroom where you stay on topic. Those three things, openness, respect, and relevance, seem to me to define an approach to the liberal arts. And very recently, I was proud to hear and read of the words of our current chancellor, uh, Franklin D. Gilliam Jr., in advance of our election, uh, which of course has been a very controversial and difficult time. Uh, this is what he had to say, which I think fits perfectly with the definition of liberal learning and what it still offers our community and our country. Now, he wrote this before the election, actually uh, at, before election day. Now we are on the eve of one of the most anticipated and closely watched elections in American history. The collective weight of all this surely creates anxiety and fear but I want you to take a moment to reflect on the core values that make us strong as a community. I encourage you to vote, of course, and to make sure your voice is heard. And once that is done, I urge you to act with civility, respect, and kindness, regardless of whether your candidates win or lose. This does not mean you must be silent. College campuses are platforms for free expression and civil dialogue. If you choose to celebrate, do so with compassion and graciousness. If you choose to protest, do so peacefully without violence or malice. Be constructive and be aware of those who experience things differently from you. If you see fellow students struggling, reach out, offer a hand and support them. That's the heart of liberal learning, to consider others who experience things differently from you to listen and to perhaps to feel along with them and perhaps in some cases to change the way you think and feel yourselves. Alice Irby, my dear friend, is a, a wonderful personification of those values and I'm uh, delighted to participate in this event. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Chris. Alice, you have a comment from your friend, Mary Owens Fitzgerald in the chat box. And so Mary, if, we'll, if we unmute you, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you said for Alice and the memories that you have as well. Mary, there we go. Can we hear you, Mary? Can you hear me? Now? We can. We can. Yeah. I just loved Alice's book. Her early story so coincided with mine, and it brought back so many memories. My grandmother ran a boarding house. I was born and lived on the river um, and grew up in a small eastern North Carolina town. The opportunity to go to women's college was just wonderful for me. It was a great experience. And I am so privileged to have gotten to know Alice well over the last several years. Uh, the book brought back so many poignant memories. Alice, I really thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Mary Owens. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate that. I think Barbara Paramore is here. 
And so Barbara, I know that you were mentioned in Alice's book and, and um, love to hear from you as well. Barbara, you, there you are. Yes. Uh, where are you, Barbara? You're muted. She's still muted. Hey, unmute. Unmute yourself, Barbara. Well, Barbara, we're gonna we're not gonna forget you. We're gonna come back to you. But in the meantime, we have a question from Chris Davidson, and Chris wants to know, Alice, how has writing this book changed you? And what unexpected lessons did you learn through the writing process? Well, I must say that when I first got the book in my hand, I said, what on earth have I done? Because much of my life, I've been a kind of private person. And then I realized that I'd really exposed myself. So my knees shook a little bit. But then I said, well, it's done. And I must say that it has been it has brought me incredible joy because I have gotten uh, to know people that I didn't know. I've been able to be <clears throat> in touch with people that I haven't been in touch with for 70 years sometimes. And I've learned something about their stories as well as my story. One of the reasons I wanted to write this, at first it started out as just stories, a few stories for my family. But then with the encouragement of three people, Ron Rohde, my writer friend, Linda Hobson, my editor, and Anthony Paula Castro, my publisher, I actually turned it into a book. <clears throat> and I, one of the reasons I decided to do it was that I hoped it would bring back memories of other people, people that lived during the 20th century. Because after all, I lived through seven decades of the 20th century and a lot of things happened then. And I thought it would be interesting to people to hear about some of that, especially to some young women who had no idea of the things that young Korean women faced in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So I would say that I've learned a lot about myself as I not just read through the book, but as I talked with people that had similar experiences. One, for example, I have a, a story in there about bridge, my addiction to bridge. And the, the weekend that I described involved a, a young man, a Johnny King. Well, lo and behold, after the book came out, I got a telephone call from Overton Suda, a fellow I grew up with in Weldon. He said, I just read that, that story and you know, Johnny King and I played bridge the whole time we were at Duke. He said, I didn't get quite as addicted as you did, but Eddie Lee Elts and, and uh, George Joyner, uh, Jack Joyner came to Durham every weekend and we played bridge every weekend. So those kinds of connections just came out of the woodwork and made my life much richer. So I want to urge everybody to write your stories. Write your stories, even if you never get them published, write them for your family and write them for your friends because everybody has amazing stories. That's great advice. It looks like Barbara's in now. So Barbara Paramore, would you like to share some thoughts with us? Well, first of all, I want to salute the Women's College, which launched me on a fascinating career in education. Uh, later on, I became the uh, second woman to head an de academic department on the NC State University campus. So uh, the Women's College prepared me well for what was mainly a, a man's world there for a long time. At any rate, of, of interest is that on one of our trips, Alice and I found out by looking at our passports that we were born on the same day in the same year. So in a way, we're twins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, I can't say enough about the uh, wonderful four years I had at the Women's College. It was just, it, 
prepared me for everything that I did later on. And I had a fascinating career in public education through the years. So thank you, Alice, for being one of my classmates way back then. And everybody else who cares about education that is uh, the foundation, of course, my whole career was in public education. I was a school principal in elementary school and then um, a head of an academic department at NC State for many years. So thank you, Alice, for being my friend and classmate. It, it enriched my life, Barbara. Uh, my, my thanks go to you. That is really special. Um, Alex, we have another uh, question for you as a comment. She said, Alice, you have brought back wonderful memories of when I first met you. I believe it was 54 when you were a counselor at Girl State and I was attending. It was my year to be governor and how wonderful you and Mr. Charlie Phillips were to me. You are such a gifted person and a dedicated alumna of UNCG, Barbara Fodder. Oh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. I was hoping I didn't know quite how to find her, so I was so thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I'm so glad you found out about this. Yeah. Absolutely. I, was, I, Absolutely. I love Girl State. And you know, when I worked for Mr. Charlie, then one of my responsibilities was Girl State. And it, it's always been a special spot in my life. My, yeah. Well, Alice, when you and I were speaking before today, you had a couple of stories that you kind of wanted to allude to in this time. So anything special that you'd like to share that went yes. in your presentation? Yes, I, I have a couple of stories I'd like to tell about the reach, the far reach of the Women's College. I went to um, Tasmania, the little island on the bottom of Australia in 1976 as the chaperone of a drill team from Rutgers University. I was there for three weeks. But when we got there, we were greeted by the Australian American Club vice president, who said, uh, Mrs. So-and-so can't be with us to greet you, but she would like to have you over to her home for dinner. Well, I was thrilled with that. So we went to her, several of us, there were three chaperones. We went uh, to this person's home for dinner. And while we were sitting there, she said, well, you know, I haven't been back to the United States for so many years. She was an American that had married a doctor in Australia. She said, but I've decided to go back uh, this year for my college reunion. And I said, where did you go to college? She said, well, I went to the women's college. I said, you must be kidding. I said, what year? She said, well, I graduated in 1926. I said, that was the year my mother graduated. She said, what was your mother's name? I said, Margaret Hudson. She said, Margaret Hudson? I lived right across the hall from her in women's dormitory. Her, I'm not sure I've got her maiden name correct, but I think she said her maiden name was Annie Lou Marine, and I know she was from Goldsboro, North Carolina. So can you imagine that all the way to Australia in 1976, and I meet somebody that knew my mother who was a graduate of NCCW. I have another little story to tell. This is much more recent. This is also about what I think of as the reach of UNCG. Andrew and I were sitting outside, as required now, uh, having lunch at a restaurant here in Raleigh, one of the shopping centers. And we noticed this tall, good looking young man sort of standing on the edge of the area where the uh, tables and chairs were. And he had on a Spartan t-shirt. So as he started to walk by, I sort of stopped him. I said, excuse me, are you just wearing that shirt that somebody gave you or did you go to UNCG? He said, I went to UNCG. Uh, I said, he said, I graduated a couple of years ago in political science and now I work, so I don't remember where he works. I said, well, I went to the woman's college and he knew about the woman's college. He said, well, you did. I said, yes, that was a long time ago. <laughs> And so I talked a little bit about the Women's College and the emphasis on the liberal arts and had 
the dedication to learning and so forth. And I think I may have mentioned the Ashby College as an example of that. And he said, it's still that way for me. I said, well, one of the things that I think has made it special is the way they've reached out to all groups and all ethnic groups and populations. And it really is probably more representative of our population than any university around. He said, that's one of the reasons I chose to go. He said, I was admitted at several other universities, some very selective. He said, I chose to go to UNCG because of its academic curriculum and the fact that there were people from all over everywhere there. I loved it, he said. I think that's a fabulous tribute to UNCG as it is now. So I wanted to share that. I do with too. You. I do too. Thank you, Alice. Um, before we close, we had one other comment from Joan Knowles, who says, I too enjoyed Alice's book and it brought back many memories of North Carolina to me. I'm a 1959 graduate of WC. So you have several people who have enjoyed your book and enjoy your stories. And um, you all share a, a, a fate about WC that's really special and unique. So if anybody else has any other questions, I think, Alice, is there anything else you'd like to summarize with well, us before we I, close today? Yeah, I, I've said in my comments that I mentioned the fact that gender was not included in the first conversions of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little backstory of that. Virtually nobody was in favor of including gender in that legislation. It reminded me of the 1860s when women were not included in the voting constitutional amendments. <clears throat> but the, the bill was in the House Rules Committee and there was a man from Virginia named Howard Smith that was chairman of that committee. He did not want the civil rights bill to pass. Emanuel Sello was the, was the leader, the bill's leader, manager on the floor. And Emanuel Sello was trying to get it out of the committee. So there was great pressure on Howard Smith to move that bill. There's also pressure from the president and the members of the Senate. He decided and, and thought that if he included sex just those three little letters, sex, and the bill that it would go down to defeat because nobody wanted women included, including Sell, Emanuel Sella. Emanuel Sella, don't put that in the bill. Please don't put that in the bill. It might kill it. The civil rights leaders didn't want it in the bill. They said, don't put that in the bill. That might kill it. He put it in the bill anyway. It came out. There were about maybe three, four women in the Congress then. Of course, they were for it, and, and they lobbied for it. Well, lo and behold, it passed. And when it went to the Senate, the president didn't want any amendments to it because he was worried that if they started having amendments, it would fail. And he had a hard enough time getting the votes for closure. As a matter of fact, the Democrats were not in favor, most of the Democrats were not in favor of closure. And it took Everett Dirksen, the minority leader in the Senate, to get 26 or 27 votes to vote for closure to get that bill through. Mm. So it passed with sex in it. And that, that was the beginning. <laughs> so I think that's a fascinating history and most people don't know that. So I, thought, don't. I thought this audience would like to know that. <laughs> most certainly. Oh, before we close out, I also wanna thank Bob Ireland for his comment and his compliments to you, Alice, for a wonderful book that he's enjoyed reading. So. In closing, he, he's also a writer. He writes also, mysteries. So, and he writes really good mysteries. They're not too long, they're clear, well structured. So, look him up on uh, Outer Banks Publishing. Uh, well, your range of friendships is, is um, reflective of you and your life, Alice. And thank you so much for your incredible presentation. I feel like you've carried us with you on your life's journey. And I, I know that we are all richer for that. Um, just to let our audience know, we'll be taking a break from our Vanguard virtual series in the month of December, and we will return on January 19th. And if you have ideas for things that you would like to see, we try to do these once a month. We'd love to hear your suggestions and recommendations, and you can just send those to alumni at uncg.edu. We make that really easy. And uh, in January, scheduled is Emily Heron Wilson class of 61 to present. And I know that we'll have another memorable presentation for you. So until then, 
I wish each of you good health and a happy holiday season. Alice, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I've enjoyed it immensely. And thank I wish you. to see everybody and give them a hug. <laughs> well, we'll do this virtual hug. Thank Great, you, everybody. everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining in. It was my pleasure. Thank you. My real pleasure. Everybody be well. <laughs>